so we have three talks uh, in this session. So the first talk is on uh, uni a unilateral to mutual authentication compiler for key exchange with applications to client authentication in TLS 1.3. Uh, and this is by Hugo Krochik from IBM Research, and Hugo is going to give the talk. This works? Yes. And this one? No. Uh, hi. Um, so, yeah, so this is a unilateral to mutual authenticated key exchange compiler with a motivation and applications to client authentication in TLS 1.3. So, uh, authenticated key exchange, the traditional case of mutual authentication, we have two parties that want to share a key. Uh, they, they have some long-term keys, which can be public or, or, or symmetric shared keys. And each party authenticates to the other, and then they output a key, and uh, the identity of the peer with whom they uh, think they are uh, talking to. Um, and of course, we want the key to be secure in the sense of being indistinguishable from a random string. Uh, in the unilateral case, we have two types of, uh, of, par of parties, of players, servers and clients. And in this case, only the servers have long-term keys and while the clients are anonymous, so at the end of the uh, exchange, they both have a shared key, but only the servers have an uh, output which represents the identity of the peer they believe they are talking to. The, the servers don't, don't output an identity, they don't know who they are talking to. So, a natural question would be, uh, you know, one way of uh, building a, a key exchange protocol would be that we build a unilateral authenticated key exchange where only one party authenticates, and then we upgrade it to a mutual authentication. Even though this is a natural question, uh, actually it was uh, a very, I mean, not, 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 not very treated in the, in the, in the literature, um, maybe because in the formal methods and the, you know, the, the basic definitions, uh, there was more, f more focus on the mutual authentication. Anyway, there are some papers, very few, that actually treat the unilateral case. Um, and even though there were compilers from unauthenticated to mutually authenticated uh, protocols from unilateral to mutual authenticated, the only paper I know that is doing that explicitly is this J, uh, Jager KS, JKSS from Asia Clear 2010, but that paper actually, the, the compilers they define are, are, are actually, in, don't, don't work. The, there is some the, the identity that should be put some, in some places, so uh, I call this that they are uh, underspecified. Uh, but at the same time, uh, unilateral authenticated key exchange is something that you find in practice. Actually, you find it in the most common protocol in practice, which is TLS. Uh, the, the default setting of TLS is that only server uh, authenticate to clients, uh, where clients can uh, um, optionally to authenticate to, but the basic thing is that servers authenticate. And uh, also for TLS, the early works uh, focus mostly on the mutual authentication, even the JKSS 12 paper that actually started a long list of papers analyzing TLS 1.2 and then TLS 1.3, that paper still did the mutual authentication, but later papers really, we, we've seen many papers doing the unilateral one. Uh, but this question of upgrading from unilateral to uh, mutual authentication was not really treated. Uh, actually, uh, these, uh, this compiler is a very natural question in the, in the setting of TLS, uh, because TLS has the server authentication and has an optional client authentication that comes usually after server authentication, definitely in TLS 1.3. You, you, you actually run a server-only authenticated and, and then optionally the cli client authentication. Um, so basically what you have in TLS 1.3 in a very schematic way, you know there is a client hello sending a Diffie-Hellman G to the X, server hello sends G to the Y, 
uh, the server signs the, the transcript uh, with its certificate and then sends what is called the server finish message. And in the, in the third uh, fl flow, the client sends a finish message where this finish message is actually a MAC on the transcript. And that's it, that's the basic protocol. If you want to add client authentication, then the client sends its certificate. In this case, it has to have a, a certificate and a signature also on the transcript. Again, the finished is, is a MAC, but that MAC is there, particularly in the case of uh, an authentication by the client, is only it serves some form of uh, a key confirmation. Um, what actually does this, the, the authentication here is the signature. Anyway, so, uh, so one question is what, what, what mechanisms we can use for the client to authenticate in this case? In the, in the case of, of, of uh, TLS 1.3, you can notice that there is a, a, a combination of a signature and a MAC under the client finished, uh, but there may be other mechanisms to do this. Uh, so TLS 1.3 presents naturally this question of extending a server-only authentication to client authentication, but actually it does more than that. Uh, it, it, it presents a case which uh, is, is not common, which is what is called post-handshake authentication, which means that uh, the server and the client uh, run a server-only uh, authentication, and they start sharing data, I mean, change, exchanging data with the session keys, and at some point, they, uh, the server tells the, the client, well, now I want you to authenticate. But I want you to authenticate, and we will keep using the same key as we derived before. So this is a retroactive uh, authentication in the sense that, OK, show me that you were the one with whom I exchanged that key that we were already using. Um, OK, so uh, the, the, the client is now supposed to uh, authenticate the key that was exchanged in the past. Moreover, it's supposed to authenticate the data that was already exchanged. I mean, um, and this will authenticate the data, but it will also authenticate other information that is used to derive keys or, uh, uh, you know, re resumption sessions and stuff like that. So this is a very uncommon situation with uh, authentication. Uh, and it turns out that actually the, our, our approach of this type of compiler thing is, is, it works well also to deal with this uh, post-handshake authentication. Uh, so basically what we want, uh, at least to be compatible or be useful to TLS 1.3, we want that uh, after running the, U, uh, by the way, I, I, UA is unilateral authentication, MA is mutual authentication, so I'll call it UA and MA. So after running the UA protocol, and we are not, we are not going to assume anything on the UA protocol except that it is a UA secure uh, key exchange. Uh, we create an MA protocol out of it without changing P1, okay, without changing the key, the session key, and the only thing we can do is to add steps to P1, okay? And again, in the case of uh, TLS 1.3, this will give us client authentication and also uh, the reg in the regular case, which is uh, before they start exchanging uh, uh, data, but also in the post handshake client authentication, which comes after they already change, exchange data. And uh, it turns out that this is uh, uh, the right tool or at least a useful tool here. Uh, I call this the particular compiler that I will present SIGMAC. Uh, by the way, there was another talk today in the morning of something else called SIGMAC. Uh, please tell these people not to use it anymore. <laughs> so SIG SIGMAC stands for si Signature and, and MAC, because that's what we are going to do. But also, I had this SIGMA protocol from many years ago, and uh, it is a, it's SIGMA-related compiler, so SIGMA can be also understood like that. Anyway, so how does it work? Giving a, a, a UA secure P1, uh, which, you know, in, in which the client knows the identity of the server because the server uh, uh, authenticated, while S outputs the key without an identity from the client because it doesn't know it. What we do is that 
Now, in addition to the servers having a, a long-term public key or, 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 or shared key, now also the client will have a key like that. And what, uh, at, uh, when the, the, the UA protocol ends, the, uh, the client C sends two elements to the server, a signature on what I call seed star, which is a part of the transcript, and I will talk more about what goes in seed star, and a Mac uh, with a key that is actually derived from the session key of, uh, of the protocol P1. Um, and in this case, now we have that uh, uh, actually, yeah, actually, actually now, now the client and the, and the server will output uh, a session with a, a peer identity, and they will have a key session that we call KS. S, oh, okay, so S verifies the signature on the Mac, and if they valid, then it also outputs uh, the session saying, I am the server, I exchange the key with this particular client, with this session ID, and this is the key that I computed. So this pair of signature and Mac, I call it the CSM message. Uh, C, right, is the client's signature and Mac. That's the CSM message. And I will use that uh, 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 in the next slide. Uh, let me skip this uh, remark. Uh, so uh, picturally, we have the sigma. Uh, I mean, we start with P1 that derives the key K. Sigma takes K, derives two keys, a session key and an authentication key, and compute the MAC. Uh, now, the MAC is computed on the two identities, the client identity and the uh, server identity, while the signature is computed by the client on some subset of the transcript that we will uh, discuss now. And then they will use the key KS as the session key for whatever they want to do. In, in TLS will be to protect uh, data, you know, re record layer data. But this is not necessarily useful only in, uh, in TLS. Uh, this, this pair uh, of uh, CS, the CSM message that is supposed to take any uh, unilateral protocol and upgrade it to a mutual authenticated one. Now, why do we mark both, uh, both uh, identities? The, 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 the client of, uh, uh, marks the two identities. So uh, 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 marking the identity of C is obvious. If you only ask to sign the transcript, then anyone can come and, and sign the transcript, knowing the session key or without knowing the session key. So that definitely is not enough. So you need to mark the, the, the client somehow to bind the client to, to the session key. Now, marking the identity of S is less obvious, but if we don't do that, we can show attacks with some simple examples, but I will not go over it now. You can look at it on the paper, in the paper. Now, the value seed star, the part of the transcript that is being signed by the uh, client, is, turns out to be very important uh, and, 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 and kind of tricky. And we, we will always include the session ID, what I denote SID, uh, which also I assume that it includes nonsense from the parties, and a subset of the transcript, and I will call the subset that is being signed the transcript core. Uh, it turns out that how you define the transcript core is crucial for security in the sense that for some transcript cores the protocol will be secure, for other transcript cores it will not be secure. Uh, in principle, you can think, okay, let's sign everything. Now, the reason I don't like to sign everything is because, first of all, I want to always know in these protocols what is really necessary, okay? M maybe I will sign more stuff, but I really want to know what is really necessary for security. And the other thing is that I'm trying to avoid signing the identity of, this, of the server uh, for, for privacy reasons. Uh, that that, that uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it's a nice thing to have. A, it gives you some level of, of privacy, definitely not as much as we would like in the sense of full deniability. That doesn't happen even if you don't sign the server, but you don't want to leave in too easy proof that you communicated with someone. I mean, maybe you want, but some people may not want that. 
Uh, okay. So there are many subtleties in this, uh, in, in this compiler and this analysis. Uh, maybe the main, the main subtlety is that even if you, you sign the whole transcript, this compiler is not necessarily secure. Uh, that definitely went against my own intuition. And uh, in the paper, I show a very simple example using a pretty sure key uh, protocol. The nice thing is that when, when I found that, I thought that, you know, it's the type of things of, of kryptonite that I find, which convinces only the theoreticians. But at the same time, actually, a group of uh, people working on formal proofs of, uh, of, of TLS 1.3 uh, found that attack, but uh, much better in the sense that they could show that actually it was breaking a, a, a TLS 1.3 mechanism at the time. So it's, it's, it's not just a theoretical uh, a subtlety, it's, 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 it, there is something real here. And another example of a subtlety is that if you have a Diffie-Hellman protocol, uh, we will see that actually uh, this, uh, this compiler is good for, for Diffie-Hellman protocols, but only if the signature includes g to the x and g to the y, both uh, uh, um, exponents. Uh, now, of course, the client signing its own exponent, obviously, we want it, but why would it need to sign the server's exponent? I mean, there, there's no intuitive reason for that, uh, but it turns out that if you don't do that, then the compiler will, will, will not work. So, again, uh, things that uh, make the thing less uh, straightforward than one would, uh, I would as have assumed uh, to start with. Uh, you know, I started this protocol by just writing a proof in three minutes in a piece of paper, but it took like three months. So, um, so since, since we are uh, uh, depending on what is that is being signed, then we uh, 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 introduce this notion of transcript, transcript replication security for the type of attacks that, uh, that uh, in which things can go wrong here. And uh, since transcript, transcript replication is too long, and uh, I call it replication. So replication security for short. Uh, and uh, I show that if P1 is a unilateral a UA secure protocol, which is also replication secure with respect to some subset of the transcript, then this, pro this compiler does work. I mean, outputs a, a protocol that is uh, MA secure. Um, so the notion that depends not only on the protocol, but only also in the specific transcript core that is defined for that protocol. Um, the, the, the definition of uh, replication security is, is very technical, uh, and I, I, I'm not going to get into, into the details. Um, basically, there is some game in which, essentially, the server can work as a man in the middle between the client and the server, uh, in which it al it's allowed to ch choose or any, any message it, it wants, as in a regular man in the middle, except for the transcript core. For uh, things in the transcript core, it has to relay exactly as they were chosen. And the reason for that is that in the protocol, we are going to sign this stuff. So this is the stuff that it cannot uh, cheat the server in accepting. So let me j skip this. Um, because since I'm not going to show any technical details, then the, the, the exact details of the definition is not very important. The, the thing is that the, this is the theorem that can be proven, that if P1 is UA secure and replication secure for a given transcript called tau, then P2, which takes sigma and apply to P1 with a seed star, I mean the information signed that includes the original session identity, basically the nonsense of the parties, and the transcript core tau, that protocol is MA secure. And the, the proof is relatively simple, uh, but not completely trivial because it has to go through all these uh, subtleties that I told you. Somehow they have to appear uh, to take be taken care in the proof. But again, there is nothing too deep going on there. 
So, uh, now, so now we, we, I'm not claiming that Sigma is good for any protocol. I'm claiming that it is for these protocols that you can define a transcript core with respect to the protocol is replication secure. The good news about the Fielman protocols is that it doesn't matter what, what you have around the protocol, as long as the client in, uh, uh, authenticates the DFLman value of the two parties, his own and the servers, then we are fine. Also, there, there are some subtleties when you use that key, but it works. Now, for pre-shared key protocols, which are very important in, uh, in TLS 1.3, particularly because these are the protocols that implement resumption, uh, here uh, there are more, more, more complexities, as I said, there, you can show the pre-shared key, which is unilaterally authenticated, and you apply SIGMAC, and you sign everything, and it is insecure, okay? So, um, so here we have to be careful, um, and in, in particular, if you want to claim SIGMAC works with TLS 1.3, you have to show that TLS 1.3 with server authentication is replication secure with respect to, to some elements in the transcript that are included by the protocol under the signature. And, uh, um, yeah. uh, and, and there is also some, uh, some condition on the Mac that uh, not every Mac uh, satisfies, but any uh, you know, normal Mac will, will, will have that property. Now, if you are willing to sign the server's identity, then you don't need all these, co these complications of replication security. You can show that SIGMAC in that case is secure for any uh, UA secure protocol uh, without, without uh, uh, the, the, the complexity of replication security. Uh, again, we, I, we would like not to sign the server identity for privacy reasons, but you know, if you think that you can get full deniability because of that, that's actually not the case. Actually, there is a, this paper exactly 10 years ago in CCS that show the subtleties behind these notions. Um, okay, so uh, Sigma applied to TLS 1.3. Uh, all you have to note is that uh, we have the MAC because that's the finished message. We have the signature, and we have to take care of the MAC, including the, the identities and the signature, um, including the, 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 the um, transcript core for which they think this, this, uh, the proof will work. Uh, now, it, 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 you, you, know, you have to look at that in TLS 1.3, and it happens in particular the client uh, identity is included under the MAC because the client is sends the certificate. The, the, in the case of uh, a, a, an exchange where the server sends, the signa the sig sends a certificate, then the server identity is included also. If in a, in a resumption where the server does not send the signature, then you need to add something that represents the identity of the signer. This is uh, for the, these people uh, following TLS 1.3. This is basically what is now called PSK binder in the protocol. Okay, so since I'm, uh, how, how bad I'm doing? Five minutes. Uh, sorry, I'm going back. Um, so basically, the, the bottom line is that uh, TLS 1.3 does all the things that need to be done for the compiler to work, so we can apply this to the uh, TLS 1.3. Now, this is, so far, what I said is for the normal case in which the client authenticates immediately after the server as part of the basic handshake. Um, okay, let me... Okay, now. The post handshake client authentication is a more complicated case. In this case, what you have is the following. You run the P1, here is the server only the authenticated the TLS. Uh, they derive a key K. The server knows what the cl uh, client uh, identity is, but the client doesn't know. 
Okay, exactly the opposite. Uh, the client knows who the server is, but the server doesn't know who the client is. So, and they start sending data, okay, encrypted under the session key. Now, suddenly, the server says, you know what? I want to see who you are. You know, because, you know, uh, at some point, the client requested a resource that needs authentication. So, show me, show me your credentials. And then the client sends the CSM message, the MAC, and the signature, okay? And now, uh, they keep uh, exchanging data with the same key. Now, what TLS, the semantics that TLS want to give to this situation is that the, the, the client not only authenticated everything that comes after the, the, the authentication, also everything that was uh, exchanged before, the key and also the data. Okay, and it's not clear even what exactly is, 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 is the meaning of this uh, post uh, uh, or retroactive authentication. And uh, now, if we wanted to claim that, uh, that the, this thing worked the way we wanted it to work, then we should be claiming that the key K is mutually authenticated. Now, in the regular models of key exchange, mutually authenticated means that it's mutually authenticated, but also that the key is indistinguishable from random. Now, definitely this is not the case because the key was already used. And if the key is used and I give you two values, the real key or a random, of course, you, the attacker will know which one is the case because the, the key was already used in the protocol. So we cannot uh, uh, prove uh, security by indistinguishability because it, it doesn't hold, but what we can do is to prove that if that key is to be used for encryption of the data or for secure channels, then for that particular uh, application, the key is good enough, okay? There are, again, many subtleties around this, but that's more or less the idea. There is something uh, that I introduced here called functional security, which uh, tries to abstract out many of the details of uh, which secure channels and what type of applications you want. Uh, but again, I will not touch into this. And the last element that the paper takes care of is that in TLS 1.3, the CSM message, the signature, and the MAC are actually encrypted. Now, they are encrypted under the key that this signature and MAC are trying to authenticate. So there is some circularity here, right? The, you, you authenticate the key that is being used to, to encrypt yourself, and also here, using functional security, you can show that for the sake of secure channels, that key is actually authenticated by, by the client. So, summary, we have this uh, compiler, this question of compiling UA into MA. We presented a specific uh, uh, compiler, uh, that presents some surprising subtleties, particularly with respect to what is being signed uh, by the client, and particularly if you want to avoid signing the identity of the server. Uh, it turns out to be a natural approach to prove uh, client authentications in TLS and helps uh, dealing with these more challenging aspects of uh, post-handshake uh, uh, authentication. There are still questions about what exactly are the semantics, uh, but uh, we, we don't touch on that. And, uh, and again, uh, advertisement for what we all should be doing. Uh, all designs in cryptography should have a proof. You know, a, a cryptographic design without a proof has no value. Um, and sometimes with a proof, it doesn't have a value either, but, <laughs> but at least it should have it. Anyway, other compilers are possible, and it will be interesting to see what other type of compilers can be uh, shown to be to transform UA into MA. Thank you. So we have time for one quick question uh, while the next speaker sets up. I have one quick question. Is, um, so you strive to include only the minimal information in the transcript core uh, for privacy reasons. Uh, so, uh, but I, find, I fail to see the reason why you would like to minimize also the information that they put under the Mac. Uh, it seems that it's generally useful to have the full transcript there. Wait, so that what, you can uh, retroactively. Wait, wait, repeat the last part. 
so it makes, uh, it makes sense to me to include the maximum, so the full transcript in the Mac so that you retroactively authenticate all the messages that were sent by the client, like it's done in TLS 1.3, for instance. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you include, so it's okay to minimize the, the, the information that you put in the, in the signature, so what the client signs for privacy reasons. Uh, exactly. So why is the motivation, what's the motivation for minimizing the information that they put under the Mac? I mean, the, uh, I'm, I'm putting the, if you put the, the Mac and the identity under the signature, you leave a non-reputable non proof that you talk to that server. Yes. If you put it under a Mac, that's not the case. Yes. So why, so it seems that the, the compiler will also work if you put the full transcript in the Mac and uh, that will give you... Oh, 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 if you put the full transcript under the Mac, no, it, it won't. But, I mean, you can put part of the transcript, but for example, uh, if, if, if you put the GX to the Y under the Mac and nothing under the signature. No, no, I mean, keep the signature as it is, but put more information in the Mac too. So that Pu putting more information under the Mac is okay. Yeah, so, that would so messages that are sent by the client but are not part of the transcript core are unauthenticated otherwise, right? Um, so you're saying that we can put less stuff in the transcript core and more in the Mac? No. Keep the transcript core as it is and put more information in the Mac. So, so just make it less efficient. Yes, but at the, at the why, so you want more information under the Mac? Yes. Why? To authenticate the messages, all the messages that were sent by the client. You know, the, the, somehow the, the sound here is very bad. I yeah. uh, so suppose there is a message that is not part of the transcript core. Uh, uh, that message goes unauthenticated by the, uh, uh, for the server, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I can, we can follow. We, can take it we, will have, we will have this discussion in Spanish later. Yeah, we can take it to uh, no. But uh, anyway, the, I don't know. I don't know uh, what I want to say is that uh, I, I insist on having the minimal things just to understand. In, in the real protocol, you definitely have to put stuff, more stuff under the signature and, and or under the Mac like negotiation and stuff like that. So the full protocol will have more information, but for the purpose of the compiler, you don't need more than that. Yes, I, I agree. Thank, thank you. <laughs> I just have a yes or no question. Yeah. If you replace the signature with the group signature, can you get some notion of anonymous, uh, so one side authenticated, the other side anonymous? Yeah, I think so. I think so, but uh, you know, without proofs, uh, there is no Uh, which one? The one I didn't. Used my is the one that uses Sigma? <laughs> okay. I think it was a follow up on, on Santiago's question or somewhat related. So I think it's probably you, you don't explicitly say that adding more things only makes it stronger. Um, but it, it, for TLS, for instance, it would be good to show that because TLS obviously adds more. So you want to have kind of a proof that you, you don't break it by adding more things. So do you have proofs like that? Can, can you translate? No, no. I mean, uh, the question is if, if, if putting more things under a signature is bad. No, whether it is good, but you have, but it's, it's, it um, uh, it doesn't break your CRM. So your CRM no, stays good. You know, I take P1. I don't it's know what P1 obvious. is, okay? It's a unilateral thing. Mm -hmm. I, that's the only thing. I only care about taking that protocol and adding to it mutual authentication, okay? And for that, you don't need anything more than what you, yeah. th that I'm saying here. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's obvious that it also holds in case you, you hash in more things or you sign more yes. things. It's quite obvious, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. I mean, as long as you are not trying to to claim something like, <laughs> like non-reputability or deniability, that that's where putting more things can uh, hurt you. But other and, and and definitely, you know, my message is not that this in the actual protocol this is the only thing that will be signed because definitely you need to sign more stuff. But for other properties, not for the basic property of mutual authentication. Sorry for not. Uh, Hearing well, uh, the, the microphone is kind of. Okay, so let's thank Hugo again. Thank